Hello and welcome to the first lecture for my class, PSYC 440-640. It's a uh, combined undergraduate, graduate level class in statistics and other sort of data analytic techniques. Um, I'm recording it in the spring of 2017, just after our winter break. And you can see here a very nice comic from phdcomics.com, which uses some graphical representations of data to reveal the truth about how we tend to spend most of our time over breaks, planning to do work and then probably not doing a great deal of work. Oh well. <laughs> Anyway, this lecture is meant to be an introduction to our class. And as I said before, this is a statistics class. Um, if you're enrolled in it at North Dakota State University, which is where I'm teaching right now, um, you know that the class is called Experimental Methods, and you've heard me say that this title is a bit of a misnomer. It's not really a methods class in the sense that we don't focus a lot on the particulars of research methodology. And even if it was, it's not a class that focuses on those aspects of methodology that are germane to experimental studies as compared to non-experimental studies. It's just called experimental methods, I think, to disguise the fact that it's a statistics class so that folks in the statistics department at NDSU don't start to wonder why we in psychology are also teaching classes that they presumably are teaching or would want to teach. I'm not sure about that. It's just my suspicion. But the point is, it's a statistics class. Now, all that said, I am going to spend some time in the first lecture today and in the next lecture, the next time I record, talking a little bit about the overall research process. And I will touch upon aspects of research methodology for both experimental and non-experimental studies. And I'll talk a little bit about research design as well. Then, after those two lectures, that is, for the rest of the semester, I'll be focusing on mostly research data analysis, that is, mostly statistics and graphical representation of data. So by way of introducing them, what I'm going to cover in this particular class, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about myself, uh, which perhaps reveals a certain narcissism in my personality. Um, who knows, maybe. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the class. Now, if you're enrolled in the class, you've already heard me say some of this. If you're just watching this video on YouTube, well, gosh, that's amazing that you want to watch statistics videos on YouTube, but good for you. Um, you can see my kind of argument or presentation for why I think this class is good or important to take. Hopefully it'll um, inspire some interest in you and maybe you'll watch some of the other videos that I'll put on YouTube. Then after I've covered that, I will talk about the research process. And again, the research process is this rather generic term to refer to all the different steps that we take when conducting research, involving uh, the initial steps of coming up with an idea, of framing a particular research design, of developing particular research methods, and then finally, uh, research data analysis, which, as I've already said, will be the focus of this class for the remainder, or mostly for the remainder of the lectures that that I'll be giving and recording. So first off, a little bit about me. Uh, this comic, and I might not have mentioned it, but the previous comic I just posted are from xkcd.com, an excellent uh, web comic series. And I like this one because it kind of highlights in a sort of a funny way, I think, what I think of as kind of my, my loving slash slightly hating relationship with statistics. And that's really what I want to talk about right now. So statistics and me, when I first started my undergrad education many, many, many years ago, I read a lot about the history of psychology. I was interested in a very general sense in research in psychology. And as I read, I often came across particular quotes in books that reminded me or pointed out to me how important mathematics and statistics are. So just to pick two of those, from Carl Pearson, one of the founding figures in the history of statistics, especially the type of statistics that we use in psychology and other behavioral sciences. He wrote in one of his books, Statistics is the Grammar of Science. A uh, contemporary and intellectual rival of Pearson, R.A. Fisher, who is also a kind of a founding figure in the realm of statistics, especially the type of statistics we do, uh, wrote, 
We have the duty to, of formulating, of summarizing, and of communicating our conclusions in an intelligible form in recognition of the right of other free minds to utilize them in making their own decisions. Um, sort of suggesting that part of what we're doing in science is clearly representing our findings. And often that representation uh, or the discussion of our findings involves mathematics or particularly statistics. So the point is, as I read this stuff, as I read quotes like this and quotes from other uh, inspiring authors, you know, Paul Meal, Lee Kronbach, uh, Jacob Cohen, etc., it became clear to me very early or very obviously that um, statistics are important to learn and important to understand. And so, as an undergraduate, I took classes in statistics and got involved with research, as, as many undergraduates do. Eventually I got into graduate school and uh, I took more classes on statistics and did a lot more research. And to be perfectly honest, during all this time, I, or at least during much of this time, I felt like I was struggling with statistics. I was reminded of the Greek myth, uh, mythical figure Sisyphus, who is doomed by the gods to roll a boulder up a hill in the underworld every single day and as he reaches the top of the hill and masters his task he inevitably slips and the boulder rolls back down the hill and he has to repeat the task infinitely forever this is kind of this the greeks vision of a horrible torture you know endless pointless labor and at the risk of exaggerating the point a little bit too much it sometimes felt this way to me when i was studying statistics i would master a particular concept like how to do multiple regression or how to handle uh, basic factorial ANOVA and then a few months later or a semester later I'd realize I'd kind of forgotten it or lost that apparent mastery and I'd, I'd feel as if I was struggling and starting all over again. And this raises an interesting question. You know, statistics are important to learn or at least I think they are, or I, I hope you think they are too, but they're hard to learn. And you might wonder, you know, why is it the case that they are hard to learn? You know, just as you sit here, you might want to ponder that for a while and, and see if you can come up with a good answer uh, to the question. When I pose this question in class, people often answer by saying things like, well, the types of statistical analyses that we do in psychology, which is the area I teach in, tend to be rather complicated. And that's true. So it's hard to learn some of the stuff we want to learn. Um, it's probably also fair to say that many of the people who go into psychology are perhaps interested in research, but they're not hardcore math people. They're not people for whom math has, at least in their past, been an easy topic to learn. And that's not a criticism, it's just an observation that I'd make about myself and about many people I know. And perhaps you're one of these folks as well. So it's math, it's hard math. Many of us are not sort of naturally really good at math, or at least it doesn't seem that way. I would also add that a lot of the math that we do, a lot of the statistics we do, is kind of non-obvious. It's not the type of thing that you can reasonably sort of intuit your way through. There's some level of complexity that I think is difficult to appreciate. So it's a challenging topic. Um, it's something that I feel like I struggled with for many years, but there's a good side to this story. And the good side is that eventually I kind of had a breakthrough. I ended up reading eventually in grad school some really good statistics textbooks and one of them was the first edition of a textbook which I currently use in this class and that's Andy Field's Discovering Statistics Using SPSS for Windows. Um, now I'm not saying this book is magic, it's just a book that clicked for me and after years of teaching I, I know or I feel confident saying it's a book that clicks for many students. Uh, recently I was reading a different stats textbook and the author of that book pointed out that the best statistics textbook is always the last one you read, meaning the last one you read that really kind of clicked and connected with you. So this was my experience. This book kind of spoke to me or connected to me. Um, and um, <clears throat> it seems to be the way for other students. So after discovering this, I started to feel like I was making sustained progress with my learning or my study of statistics. I also had some good classes. I really give a lot of credit to one or maybe two professors I had in grad school who who maybe presented that material to me about regression, about ANOVA, about some of these other topics in a way that I finally got. And maybe I was in the right place in my life to get those messages, or maybe those teachers were particularly gifted. Either way, I'm grateful. Um, and the important point in both the book that I'm talking about and the classes that I'm referencing is I started to see the connection between research design, research methods, and research analyses. And that helped me to learn the statistics, the research analyses, in a way that really stuck. I think what had happened to me, although I didn't realize this beforehand, is that 
I had sort of learned statistics in the abstract, like a set of procedures which you could do if you wanted to maybe sometime down the road. Uh, it almost had a kind of a numerological feel to me. It was just these strange abstractions that seemed important, but I couldn't really say why. As I studied more and learned more and thought more, I saw that no, research uh, data analysis, statistics is a set of tools that we use as part of an ongoing process, and that process the research process is designed to help us answer questions. Now the current version of Andy Field's textbook uses this graphic and it's meant to describe or represent pictographically the research process and if we wanted to kind of divide up this this flow chart we could say well you know, there's this stage in research the research process where we kind of come up with an idea we generate a theory perhaps, then from it generate some hypotheses and identify variables that we want to study to test those hypotheses. We might call that the research design process. You're designing the overall look of your study. Then there's a stage uh, of which we might call research methods where we're gathering data on those particular variables to test those hypotheses and thereby evaluate those theories which are important for those general ideas that we've had. Um, you know, you might, we call this research methods and you might even take a whole class on research methodology and learn the finer points of different ways to design questionnaires or build research apparatus or so on and so on. Then finally, there's research data analysis. This is where we have data from our research methods that we did developed or chose because of our research design and we need to do something with that data. We need to represent it pictographically, perhaps creating graphs or, uh, or kind of tables for it or more commonly or not more commonly but more importantly I'll say for this class we want to develop statistical models to describe that data and to represent or to use that data to uh, represent aspects of the population of data that we're sampling from. Um, so the point here in this, this flowchart, uh, or the reason I'm putting it up right now, is just to suggest that for me, maybe for you too, seeing those connections between design and methods of analysis made the statistics part, i.e. the analysis part, a lot more sensible to me. I saw kind of the connections, and those connections, or seeing those connections, helped make the whole learning process uh, easier for me. And after seeing these connections, I kind of feel like I had this breakthrough and I embraced the struggle to learn statistics. And my choice of imagery here is actually deliberate. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, French existentialist writer Albert Camus, who, if you know him or you've read his work, uh, famously wrote an essay called The Myth of Sisyphus, where he you know, considered the figure or the, the story of Sisyphus and how, in a way, you can look at Sisyphus as this pitiful character. But from another angle, you can look at him as this kind of existential hero. If you imagine that Sisyphus recognized the sort of in essential eternal nature of his struggle, he would always be rolling this boulder up this hill, but he embraced that process, literally embracing the boulder as his own, his own project that he was working on, and, and in that found a certain sense of transcendence or freedom. And again, I perhaps I'm indulging in kind of hyperbole and exaggeration here, but for me, I kind of felt like that was me in graduate school. I hit this point where I had this kind of existential breakthrough with statistics, and I saw that, yeah, I'll probably be struggling to some extent with statistics for the rest of my life, or at least for the rest of my, my career, but I can learn to love that process and enjoy the learning and, and enjoy the constant revisiting of topics and deepening my understanding rather than seeing it as, as a sort of a, a failure, like, oh gosh, I used to know how to do repeated measures of ANOVA really well, but I've kind of forgotten it. That's a shame. No, no, that's, that's an opportunity for me. That's something that I can enjoy revisiting and, and deepening my understanding about. So, you know, I saw connections with my own research. I got curious to learn more about statistics and, um, you know, to put it another way, I, I learned to quit worrying and love statistics. And I hope you learn to quit worrying and love statistics. I, I used to present research on this. There actually is a small uh, literature of research on so-called statistics anxiety, and it probably won't surprise you to learn that that literature suggests that many students, especially many students in psychology, are, approach statistics with a lot of anxiety and worry. They feel like they don't know how to do statistics or that they're going to do them wrong and 
then their professor or their colleagues will make fun of them, or I don't know. Um, they worry, and that's understandable. I used to worry. I still do sometimes. But I want you and me to quit worrying at least a little and embrace the process and learn to love statistics. So the important ideas so far in my lecture are that learning statistics, I think, takes a kind of a sustained effort. Uh, for me, at least, it's kind of this lifelong process, but one that I've learned to really embrace and, and sort of enjoy, to be, to be honest. Um, what's been helpful for me, and hopefully will be helpful for you, is seeing the connections uh, between the statistics that you learn, the particular tests or procedures you learn, and the research <clears throat> that you are doing or the research that you care about even if you don't currently do research like these days i'm not an active researcher but i read a lot of research and i'm very interested in research and knowing about statistics really allows me to appreciate research at a deeper level it's like if you've ever learned to play piano or guitar it really deepens your appreciation of music because when you're listening to music on your computer or on your ipod or whatever you can hear different parts of the song or you understand how complicated the song can be because you know a bit more and it's there's something analogous with understanding statistics and reading research so that's important idea so far or some important ideas i should say okay less about me more about the class why should you take this class? Now, some of you are enrolled in this class. You're probably watching this video on YouTube to kind of refresh your knowledge from my lecture. Good for you. Some of you, again, maybe have stumbled onto this lecture on YouTube and you're not in my class. So uh, maybe this will seem a little bit outside of, of your direct interest, but, but bear with me. Why should you take this class if you either are or at least could imagine yourself taking the class? Well, this class will help you refresh your knowledge about univariate statistics. Now, most of the people who are enrolled in the class that I'm teaching have already taken other stats classes, so they're already familiar with things like regression and ANOVA and some of those other common tests and procedures. I'm going to review those things, but hopefully do so in a way that deepens the understanding that my students have. Um, these are univariate statistics, by the way, in the sense that there can be more than one predictor variable in our models, but there'll always be one and only one outcome variable. Or put another way, there might be more than one independent variable in our model, but there'll only be one dependent variable. Now, if that makes sense to you, great. If it doesn't, bear with me, because we'll be talking more about predictor and outcome variables, independent and dependent variables, throughout the whole semester, starting, if not in this lecture, then certainly in the next one. But point is, this class is a review or an opportunity to review, but to deepen your knowledge of these tests and procedures. Now, particularly, I want to deepen or expand your knowledge by introducing the general linear model. General linear model is um, a, uh, a way of thinking about model building, models in statistical tests, um, that integrates different types of statistical tests, which you may think of is rather different. You, if well, if you're like me, you maybe took classes in school that focused on regression, and then maybe you took another class that focused on ANOVA and thought of those two things, regression and ANOVA, as rather different. Like, yeah, they're both statistics or statistical test procedures, but they're pretty different. I took them in different classes. They seem to apply to different types of research. Well, they're actually the same or, or essentially the same. You know, ANOVA is technically a special case of regression. Regression is a way of doing a general linear model. So learning about the general linear model as this kind of framework allows you to see the connections between things like ANOVAs and t-tests on the one hand and regressions on the other hand. And seeing those connections, again, to me, makes that material much more memorable. It helps you think about these procedures in a deeper way, a way that I hope will be enjoyable or enriching to your education. Um, also, I'm going to try and introduce the model comparisons approach, and th this is just a way of doing hypothesis testing, something we're often doing in science. We're testing hypotheses to evaluate theories that those hypotheses are based on. Well, how do we compare one hypothesis to another? Well, we can create statistical models that apply to one hypothesis and statistical models that apply to another, and then we can say, of those two models, which captures more of the variance in the outcome variable, which tells the better story about the data that we're trying to um, study. Uh, and this model comparison approach is like the general linear model idea, this sort of 
general approach, this framework that we can apply to a lot of the statistical uh, procedures and tests that we do. And thinking about hypothesis testing from a model comparison approach, I think is, is more useful or more flexible than just thinking about a rather generic like, well, if you do a t-test, you have to say the null hypothesis is zero and the alternate hypothesis is some other value. And then you do this particular procedure and but if you do an ANOVA, it's different. But if you do a regression, it's different. It's nice to see the connections. I guess I'm saying that repeatedly, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. Why should you take this class? It's abstract and interesting. Um, I'm someone who likes philosophy. I like history. I'm an academic, uh, for better or for worse. I, I like abstractions. And I, if you're someone at least a little bit like me, then maybe you do too. You like thinking about big ideas. And this class will provide some opportunities to do that. We will, although we'll talk a lot about practical stuff, like how to do a multiple regression, how to test for mediation using uh, the Baron and Kenny framework, uh, how to do repeated measures ANOVA. We'll also step back at times to consider in abstract uh, some of the important questions in science, like what is control? Or how do we, uh, what differentiates like statistical control from experimental control? Or how do we um, handle multiple comparisons to testing without inflating family-wise type one error rate? Things like that, which you may be familiar with some of the stuff I just said, or maybe that's all uh, Greek, no pun intended to you. Um, either way, we'll consider those abstractions. And if you're like me, at least a little, that'll be kind of fun and interesting. But the class is also concrete and practical. You know, like I said before, we're gonna use concrete examples. We're gonna think about real world problems. And I think that's important. If you're doing research, you probably want to know how to do certain types of research data analysis so that you can do it with your own data. But even if like me, you're not doing research these days, you're hopefully always reading about research. You know, this picture here is a little bit anachronistic. I'm sure most of us don't these days read like the science section of a real paper newspaper, but hopefully most of you are spending time in the science section or the health section of major news outlets like New York Times and Boston Globe. Hopefully you're following different science blogs uh, on like discover.com or um, you know many other science websites, Scientific American and so on and so on. When you read about research, it's valuable, like I said before, to have a practical appreciation for, st for statistics and for data analysis more generally. If you do that, or if you have that, you can get a lot more out of your reading. So just as an example of that, not too long ago, I came across uh, this study here. Um, this is just a study that looks at, it's part of an ongoing literature, that looks at the uh, treatment of depression in adolescents with two different types of antidepressant drugs, imipramine and paroxetine, paroxetine more commonly known as by its trade name Paxil. Um, and, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, I'm someone who studies, or at least um, I used to study, and I, I uh, treatment for things like depression. I, I've done psychotherapy for people with depression. I've advised uh, healthcare providers about prescri prescribing different sorts of drugs. So this is something that I'm interested in, the practical uh, realities of treating depression. And in order to really understand the research in that area, it's helpful for me to understand a bit, or more than just a bit, about the data analysis analysis that goes into a study like this one. I'm sure we could come up with other examples, but that's just one that clicks for me. I mean, open up any science blog, go to any science website and on almost any day, and you'll see something connected to psychology or the behavioral sciences more generally that has interesting research questions associated with it, some sort of post or link or something. And almost always knowing a bit about statistics will really deepen your understanding of whatever it is you're reading. Okay, so assuming you're either enrolled in the class, you know, because you have to take it because it's a requirement, or you've enrolled in the class because you want to take it, or you're just watching these videos, assuming I've made uh, a case that you find compelling for why you should take the class, what are the topics we're going to cover in the class? Well, in the first uh, unit, which will be, you know, this in, in real time, about the next month or so of my teaching, we'll be doing what I'm calling foundations of data analysis. And we'll be doing things like uh, so-called descriptive statistics. We'll be exploring data. We'll be making pictographic representations of data. And we'll be talking a lot about some of the underlying assumptions we make about the samples of data that we have 
that are relevant to the type of hypothesis testing which we're going to do later on in the class. And so if you've taken other stats classes before, you've probably encountered or you've had that one lecture, you've, you've read that one part in the textbook where they say, you know, the assumptions that are necessary for regression are blah, 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 blah. Uh, or, you know, if you do non-parametric tests, you don't have to make assumptions about blah, 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 blah. Some of that material can be pretty confusing. I'm going to try and present those assumptions in a way that I think is makes sense and hopefully sets the stage for what we're going to do in the next sections, which are the sections of the class where we'll actually be making statistical models and doing model comparison for hypothesis testing. So to, to be more clear about that in Unit 2, which is of course follows Unit 1, we'll be looking at so-called uh, cr uh, multiple correlation and regression analysis. This is the type of analysis which historically has been more associated with non-experimental work, uh, you know, like developmental psychological work or cross-sectional psychological work or so on and so on. Um, here we'll be looking at correlations, simple and multiple regressions, uh, stuff which you're almost certainly familiar with from other classes or from your reading of science, but we're going to try and approach it um, from a general linear model perspective and a model comparisons per, uh, approach. And we're going to hopefully deepen your understanding. We're also going to focus on to the topics of mediation and moderation, which uh, can be tested in other frameworks, but which are commonly tested in a kind of a correlation and regression framework. And it's, um, I think they're really important to know about. If you're doing research in psychology, you're almost certainly encountering tests of mediation or tests of moderation. It's important to know how those tests work, and we'll talk about some of them. Unit 3 follows, I call Unit 3 Group Comparisons Analysis. Uh, really what it is is mostly ANOVAs and t-tests, and mostly ANOVA. So analysis of variance, ANOVA, analysis of covariance, uh, ANCOVA, and factorial ANOVA, which is just ANOVA where there's more than one predictor variable, or more than one independent variable, predictor variable and independent variable being synonymous. Uh, in this <coughs> unit, I'm going to again try and deepen your understanding of, of uh, how ANOVA works. I'm going to introduce to you, if you're not already familiar with this, the idea that ANOVA is just part of the general linear model, or you can do ANOVA as a general linear model. And as I suggested earlier, ANOVA is really just a special case of regression. It's a special case in of a regression where the predictor variables are all categorical in nature. It's not fundamentally very different. Um, that said, I'm also going to touch on the more kind of old school approach to doing ANOVA, which you may have encountered in other classes, the so-called variance sums approach. You know, sum of squares within, sum of squares between, so on and so on and so on. That's not really all that different from the general linear model approach, but, you know, being conversant in both I think is handy because depending on the sources you read or the people you talk to, it's neat and useful to be able to flip back and forth between the two. That's unit three. By the way, I will talk about t-tests, you know, somewhat briefly, but t-tests can be seen as kind of a, a case of ANOVA, which is itself a case of regression, so not really all that different. Last unit of the class is unit four. I'm just calling advanced analyses, kind of a generic title. Um, here, what I'm going to introduce is repeated measures ANOVA and mixed factorial ANOVA. That's just ANOVA that have both within subjects or repeated factors and between subjects or um, uh, between groups factors. Now technically these analyses, uh, if they involve uh, repeated uh, or within subjects factors, sometimes also called dependent factors, these are technically multivariate statistics, meaning there's more than one outcome variable. So you might imagine like I'm, I'm doing a study comparing people who take Paxil to people who don't and I'm measuring their level of depression at three different time points, before treatment, mid-treatment, and post-treatement follow-up. Now, yeah, and each time point I'm measuring depression for all the people in the group that got Paxil and all the people in the group who didn't get Paxil. I actually have three outcome variables, the pre, mid, and post uh, measures of depression. So technically I'm doing multivariate statistics. Um, in this unit, I'm going to sort of make that bridge between univariate statistics and multivariate statistics and, and set you up, if, if you're taking the class, to take the multivariate stats class, which one of my colleagues teaches, which I'd highly recommend. Indeed, I'd highly recommend learning about multivariate statistics to anyone. It's just not a topic I, I'm going to cover much in this class, except as a bridge, you know, bridging from uh, sort of independent factorial ANOVA to dependent and mixed factorial ANOVA and sort of introducing a little bit of those concepts. 
it's an interesting unit. It's not a long unit. It's right at the end, of course. And uh, I, hopefully you'll find it cool. I enjoy it. Anyway, if you're in the class, what's the required text? Um, I require that you get the current version of Andy Field's uh, Discovering Statistics using SPSS. It's currently in its fourth edition, although he has a new kind of kind of companion volume out called An Adventure in Statistics, which is similar topic material presented in a different way. Um, if you're enrolled in my class, you can get this book at the Campus Bookstore. Well, if you are or if you're not, everyone can get this book uh, from online retailers or from the publisher. It's published by Sage, as you can probably see if you squint down at the bottom right corner. Um, it's an excellent book. It's, it's not the best book. There are some things I don't like about this book, but Fields' writing style makes the complex topics that he presents relatively accessible, so it's easy to pick up and learn. It's a pretty good reference. But, and this is important, he has a lot of deep material there. If you really read through his notes in the ends or in the pull-out boxes in his chapters, you can find a lot of neat information. This is a smart guy. And also, he's got chapters on some multivariate statistics like factor analysis and multi-level modeling. So if you ever wanted to go beyond the material in this class, this book has you set up. And I think it's, it's well worth having. Uh, so I recommend it. Well, indeed, in the, if you're in the class, I require it. There's a recommended text, uh, and that is uh, Judd, McClellan, and Ryan's Data Analysis, A Model Comparisons Approach, which is a slim volume, which does more or less what the, uh, what the title says. It really drills down on this idea of model comparisons using the general linear model uh, as a way of doing statistics and, and uh, unifies ideas of regression and ANOVA in, in that framework. Um, it's much more dry and technical than the field book. It's it's much more narrow and in, in focus. Um, I really like it. I think it's, it, I find it, um, I just sort of vibe, I think, with the author's writing style. Like they present stuff in a way that really clicks for me. And as I said earlier, you know, arguably all of us are different. And so we're all gonna respond differently to different texts. This is one that I really like and I recommend it. It's easy to find uh, online. It's not too expensive. So I'd recommend it. If you're in my class, I don't require it, but I again, recommend it. Speaking of recommendations, um, I told you earlier I like philosophy, I like history. Learning about philosophy and history, I, I think, deepens my understanding of topics in science and in statistics. And so I, with no reservation, highly, highly recommend the book by David Salzberg, A Lady Tasting Tea, How Statistics Revolutionized Science in the 20th Century. Um, it's excellent. He talks, uh, Salzberg talks about Carl Pearson, R.A. Fisher, some of their colleagues and contemporaries and the folks who followed them, and the way in which in the early part of the 20th century, science was really changing from how it had been before to how it is more or less now. And a big part of that change is the introduction of what we think of as kind of modern statistical data analysis. Um, it's fascinating. It's a really quick, easy read. I, I love it. I only wish it was more technical. I wish there was more math in it because it's kind of a book about math with, which is meant to be very accessible. So there's not a ton of equations or numbers in it. Um, I wish he'd written more, uh, a more technical piece, but it's understandable that he wrote more of a easy to access piece of writing. Uh, very recommended highly recommended. I guess I've said that a bunch of times. Uh, you can find it in online retailers. You can probably find it at a bookstore. There are other good history books of statistics out there. I'll probably try and mention them in later lectures. So you've got some texts. What do you need for software? Um, I recommend, uh, or I really require if you're in my class, GPower. GPower is a piece of software that's useful for power analysis in all its various forms. If you know what power analysis is already, you know why it's important. If you don't know what power analysis is, you'll learn. And uh, GPower is one of the best ways to do power analysis. One of the best ways in part because it's free. There is commercial software that's available for power analysis. Um, much of it is incredibly expensive in the hundreds or even thousands of dollars because it's purchased by research companies who have big budgets. G-Power is, well, it's certainly getting better over the years. It's in its like third and dot something, dot something edition now. Um, it's getting more accessible. It's, a, it's still a little bit clunky. It takes a little bit of practice to learn how to use it, but it's free online and um, I just do a Google search for it. Or if you're in my class, I have links in my syllabus for it. 
If you're in my class, I also require that you have Excel and Word um, from Microsoft Office or, you know, an equivalent. You know, if you use LibreOffice or OpenOffice, those will be fine. You just basically need a spreadsheeting software. I like Excel. It's got its problems. It's certainly got its criticisms, uh, but I like it because it's almost ubiquitous. You know, almost any office you go into has Excel. Um, and you can use Excel for quite a lot of statistics. Also, Excel is a good way to learn statistics. Like if you kind of do your stats quote unquote by hand in a spreadsheet, I think it teaches you a little bit about how some of the important calculations work. And Word is just a, a, an almost ubiquitous uh, word processing software that you need if you're doing the assignments in my class. Now, if you're enrolled in my class, you're at NDSU and you can get uh, those pieces of software for free for NDSU because we have a big site license. If you're not enrolled in my class, you probably already have them. But if you don't, you can also get like OpenOffice or LibreOffice or any of the, the other kind of free clones that are out there. And those will work more or less just fine. If you're enrolled in my class, you have to use uh, SPSS or maybe SAS. I'm an SPSS person. I don't love SPSS. It's got all sorts of things that I don't like about it, uh, but it's common in, all, in um, psychology research um, and other social science research. Uh, and it's what the book is written for that we're using. Now, Andy Fields and his colleagues have other versions of their book that are written for SAS. So if you're a SAS person, you can get his SAS book. And it's more or less the same, except it goes through how to do those same procedures in SAS. Um, if you're at NDSU, you can get uh, the software from NDSU. Uh, you can purchase a license for not free, but cheap. I mean, I think it's like 50 bucks or something for a year or maybe a semester. It's not a small amount of money, but it's manageable. You can get it online as well. Uh, you can even get like a trial version of it if you just want to play around with the software. Recommended software. Um, I, actually, there's a lot of recommended software that we're going to use over the se semester, but the big one I want to highlight right now is R. Um, if you're a stats nerd, you know that R is an open source statistics and graphing language. Um, you know it's incredibly tricky to learn, but you also know it's powerful and very flexible. Um, R in some ways is the cutting edge of a lot of statistics uh, research and uh, statistics um, applied statistics uh, in sciences, including in psychology and the behavioral sciences. Um, I'm not an R person. I'm trying to teach myself R slowly as the years go by. Um, and I encourage you to try too, because it's free. You can get it online and it's incredibly powerful. Like almost any type of analysis that you would ever want to do, someone's already figured out a way to do it in R and has written a package, you know, an add-on bit of software for R. So once you get comfortable using R, it makes it very quick and easy. Well, I won't say quick and easy, but it makes it possible to do rather complicated analyses. And the community of R users out there is just growing every single day. So uh, you're in good company if you learn R. To that end, in this class, I'm going to try something which I've done in past semesters, which is I'm going to offer kind of an optional seminar, um, an optional seminar on R, uh, where every week or two I'll make a video and I'll add some content to our Blackboard site, maybe even host some local meetings where we'll talk a little bit about how to use R. My goal will be to kind of replicate some of the analyses we've done in class using R. Like, okay, let's do a set of analyses in SPSS like we did in class the other day. Now let's do this in R and see if we can get the same results. Because for me, that's a good way to learn stuff. Not the best way probably, but a good way. More about the class. Um, well, what's required for the class? Um, well, if you're in the class, you have to access Blackboard. You're already uh, on Blackboard, I imagine. Um, you, you'll find there things like announcements, class outlines, links, homework, etc. If you're not in the class, if you're just watching these videos on YouTube, you won't have access to that content, but I will try to, if possible, if I can figure out how to do this in YouTube, link to other websites that I find interesting so you won't be entirely left out in the cold. Anyway, important ideas so far. This class will focus mostly on univariate statistics, meaning statistics where there's one outcome or dependent variable, and there's one or more than one predictor variables. It's not a multivariate class until the very end where we talk a little bit, we start to bridge a little bit into multivariate statistics. It's designed to teach you a broad set of data analysis tools, especially those that focus on hypothesis testing. 
because that's really important uh, for most of what we do in science in the research process. And with that in mind, I want to take the, le the rest of the time I have in this uh, lecture period, I guess, uh, to talk about the research process, what it is, the different parts of it, so that we can kind of lay a foundation for the material that we'll be talking about later on in the semester. Okay, so the research process. Now, this phrase is more or less synonymous with the phrase scientific method, and you've almost certainly encountered this before in other classes you've taken, probably as far back as maybe even junior high or earlier. Now we're going to use this flowchart from the text to look at the different parts of the research process and perhaps a good place to start is right up at the top in an area that I'd like to call generating ideas. And, and what's happening here is we're beginning to have an idea about the research that we'd like to do and we're trying to connect that idea to a particular theory. How do we do this? Well, we might find something that needs to be explained or a problem that needs to be solved. I mean, we could observe processes or phenomena in the world around us. We could consider a practical problem. I mean, this is one of the things I think is so fun about psychology and other behavioral sciences is all of us, I think, are naturally curious about ourselves, about the people around us. We, we often watch each other and, and wonder, you know, why is it that people behave this way? Or how, why is it that people have these types of problems? Or how might we solve them? So a lot of this idea generation begins with just looking around us. Uh, another source of inspiration or ideas, of course, is reading the research. You know, this is why when we work with undergraduates especially, we encourage them to spend time reading the assigned materials from class, to go to the library or go online to the library these days and find journal articles to read. You, know, you, you learn a lot by reading what other people have done and trying to see the areas of research that haven't been explored yet, or the questions that haven't been answered yet, the problems that haven't been solved yet. Um, however you do it, at some point in this stage of the research process, you come up with some sort of an idea. And to be a bit fussy about it, we might say you make some sort of a claim about the world. So you make a, a positive statement, like a particular form of therapy is useful for treating a disorder. Or a particular social cue leads to a certain emotional experience in people who perceive that cue, or so on and so on. Now in science, we're not content to just make uh, sort of passing claims about the world, you know, speculations or whatnot. We usually like to connect those ideas or those claims, those speculations to particular theories, either particular theories that already exist or we generate a new theory. And th the word theory, of course, exists in our common language and we use it in different ways in different settings. But in science, by theory, we refer we're referring to an organized set of principles that describe or explain some sort of phenomenon. And of course, in psychology and the behavioral sciences, these phenomena are usually the types of patterns of thoughts or feelings or behaviors that humans or, or some other animals uh, often have. So again, we observe the world around us, we read the literature, we come up with some interesting question or idea, and we connect that question to a particular theory that explains why that idea or that phenomenon occurs. That's our, that's our theory. Now at this point we might ask, are we doing basic science or are we doing applied science? Um, you may be familiar with this distinction from other classes, but if not, here's a quick review. Basic science is science, it's research that's done to evaluate the validity of a particular theory, to help us decide if this theory is a relatively accurate representation or explanation of a phenomenon or, or not. That's distinct, at least somewhat, from applied science. Applied science is science, it's research that's done where we're applying a particular theory to solve a problem or address a, a kind of quote-unquote real-world concern. Now I've said there's a distinction here. That distinction isn't always really sharp and, and importantly, theories are important for both types of science. Um, you know, as an example, uh, just off the top of my head right now, you know, we might be interested in um, the etiology of depression, how it is that depression develops. And uh, one theory out there is the uh, serotonin theory, which is, uh, you know, suggests uh, that levels of serotonin in the synapses in different parts of 
of the brain and elsewhere in the central nervous system are somehow deficient and this is why uh, people experience low mood uh, poor you know decreased response to positive rewards in the environment etc cetera, etc cetera. that's you know kind of how depression develops as you have low serotonin functioning um, now that theory uh, may be an accurate explanation of the etiology of depression or, or it may not and we might do and indeed there is a fair bit of basic science research to explore that question some of it you know takes place in neuroscience laboratories uh, right now um, and applied science uh, um, approach might say well you know given that we feel some confidence in the in the uh, you know serotonin theory of depression um, can we use that theory to develop a uh, solution to a problem can we develop drugs which alter serotonin levels with the expectation then then that by altering serotonin levels we'd see changes in depression and of course there's a lot of clinical pharmacology research on just that seeing if different selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Paxil and other drugs um, are efficacious at treating depression and again it's not that you know there's always a really sharp distinction but we can see that some types of research are more interested in the basic question of the theory and some are more interested in using that theory to solve or address a problem that's the distinction but either way theories are important science isn't just about making observations and making kind of vague cl uh, claims science is about developing and using theories so again how does this work again we observe the real world we read the research and we develop some sort of a general description or explanation as to why a particular phenomenon is occurring so that's our that's our theory generation stage um, this is uh, sometimes called the context of discovery this is a, a term that was developed and then later used by various philosophers of science so again why represent this pictographically we might say we make some individual observations of particular uh, features of the world around us and then through the logical process of induction we develop some sort of general principle a theory and like I said before um, the uh, philosophers of science over the years particularly Hans Reichenbach developed uh, at least I think he was the first people person to use the word context of, dis of discovery um, someone who came after him uh, but was influenced by him the very famous philosopher of science Karl Popper also refers to this idea you know, we observe the world around us and we don't just um, settle on the individual observations we make we use them to inform some sort of general uh, theory that we have about the world I feel like you can't have a lecture about uh, the research process about science about theories without including a picture and maybe even a quote from Albert Einstein so here's my shot at that idea um, and the quote I'm including is I think an interesting quote um, as you can see it reads a theory is more impressive the greater its simplicity the more different kinds of things it relates and the more it extends its area of applicability um, I included this quote because I think it highlights a really interesting idea about theories um, about science in general that we'll return to across the semester and that idea is that there's a fundamental balance when we're creating a theory when we're creating a statistical model to represent a hypothesis that's derived from a theory and so on and so on and the balance is between explanatory power and parsimony forming and testing theories is about finding the appropriate balance we want a theory to explain a lot without being overly complicated you can imagine a theory which is broadly explanatory and which explains a lot of different phenomena is a really good theory as long as it's not so complicated as to be difficult to use or difficult to apply um,
So just to review, the, the early stage in the research process is we kind of come up with an idea. And I'm being deliberately a little bit vague on how we do that because probably different people come up with ideas in different ways and it's not like there's one right way to do this. Assuming you have come up with an idea and you've kind of framed it as a theory or connected it to a theory, now your job is to design a way to evaluate that theory. So how do we begin to evaluate a theory? Well, we, we look at data. We go out in the world and look for more information. I mean, this is in a sense, the foundational idea of empiricism, you know, the philosophical tradition, which gives us science, which is we don't just have theories and allow them to exist in the abstract, or we don't try to prove them by logical uh, process. We rather try to evaluate them based on things we can observe in the real world. Now, in order to do that in, in practice, we need to define the variables that we're studying. And here we have to just reflect on the fact that anything that exists can be in some level measured, or there is some way to measure just about everything. Even the things which we study in psychology, which often seem rather abstracted or non-physical in nature, non-concrete, like you know, emotions and, and feelings and thoughts, things which we can't directly observe, we can at least in principle somehow measure. And we need to measure them in order to be able to evaluate theories that we have about them. Now, to be a bit more specific about how this works, in order to evaluate a theory, we have to set up and ultimately test hypotheses. You know, a hypothesis, you know, singular, is just a specific testable prediction that's derived from a theory. So we have a particular theory, which is a kind of a general explanation that we're accounting of how a phenomenon exists or why it occurs or so on. From that theory, general theory, we can derive at least one, and hopefully more than one, specific hypothesis, which we can then subject to testing through empirical observation. And here, let's highlight that in order to test a hypothesis, we have to expose it to falsification. We have to go around looking for a way to find that hypothesis false. I mean, the, the example that, that Popper uses, or the other philosophers of of science will use is the, the kind of the example of the black swan. Like, let's imagine, you know, you are walking around in, in parks or near ponds in the place where you live and you observe some white swans. You observe a few of them and after a while you develop the general theory or claim that all swans are white. Now, that's a fine theory to have, but you might want to evaluate it. How might you evaluate it? Well, you might say, well, I'm gonna make the prediction, I'm gonna hold the, make the hypothesis that if I go out and look for more swans, the swans that I find will be white. Now, that's the prediction we would make from the theory. Now, it may seem sensible to go out and look then for white swans, but what you should really be also looking for is black swans, right? Because if you find another white swan, it sort of goes along with the prediction you'd make from your theory. It kind of tends to support that theory that you have. Your hypothesis has been borne out. But as soon as you find one black swan, you've now failed to uh, demonstrate the prediction of your hypothesis, and you've called into question the validity of your theory. Now that may seem a bit sort of silly or, or abstract, like white swans, black swans, but the idea here is that rigorously testing hypotheses involves setting up situations or, or looking for data that could, in principle, prove your hypothesis wrong or could prove your prediction wrong. Um, other writers have talked about this as setting up strong tests of hypotheses. If you give a strong test of a hypothesis and it is uh, does not it is not disproven, then that tends to support your theory much more so than does a rather weak test of a hypothesis. Now this idea of testing hypotheses by exposing them to, to potential falsification so as to evaluate the theories that those hypotheses are based on is so important that our man Karl Popper talked about it as the criterion for demarcation, that is the line that separates truly scientific uh, projects from non-scientific or pseudo-scientific projects. He argued that, you know, hardcore sciences are sciences where the theories lead to predictions, the predictions can be tested through rigorous attempts to falsify them, and that's different from pseudo or non-scientific 
projects where we have ideas, we maybe call them theories, but we can't form specific testable predictions, we choose not to form specific testable predictions, and even if we can, they're very hard to test in any sort of way that allows for falsification. So again, in his examples, uh, you know, his critique of psychoanalytic theory, he said, yes, you know, psychoanalytic theory is sort of presented as this theory, but it's not a theory that yields many testable predictions, i.e. hypotheses, and even when those hypotheses are made, it's hard to actually test them in a way that allows them to be falsified because they mostly involve, you know, supposed unconscious processes which people have very little access to and which can't be easily uh, measured in any sort of way that yields data and uh, that can be analyzed. So it, it may sound like science, it may be presented as science, but Popper, and of course many people since then have argued, it's not really science because of this criterion of demarcation between the science and the non-science. To further dwell upon the philosophy of science, let's just observe that, technically speaking, we never really prove that theories are true. Again, in our common language uh, or usage, we say things like, I believe this theory is true, I believe the theory of evolution is true, but in science, in a very sort of technical sense, what we really mean is that theories can be supported or you know, the writer and philosopher and scientist Paul Meal said they can be corroborated. Um, if we repeatedly test good hypotheses based on those theories, and if repeatedly those hypotheses uh, are not disproven, are not sort of uh, falsified. So if we have a theory that yields many testable predictions, many testable hypotheses, and that each of these uh, testable hypotheses survives falsification, is not falsified, then over time we grow kind of confident in the theory. The theory seems credible to us. And technically it's never proven true, but it becomes our favored or preferred uh, theory as compared to other theories which might yield predictions, hypotheses, which are falsified. Um, this is called by philosophers of science uh, the context of justification. So again, we have a general principle, a theory, through the logical process of deduction, we create a specific prediction, a hypothesis, and we expose it to, uh, we expose it to testing uh, by a potential for falsification. Again, philosophers like Popper and Reichenbach refer to this as the context of justification, where we're trying to decide if the theory is justified, or, or I guess more t precisely, if we are justified in holding that theory. Uh, again, I'm pretty sure Reichenbach is the first person who uses this phrase, context of justification, but Popper kind of picks up this basic idea and develops it very much so in his book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. So let's use a practical example here. You know, I mentioned uh, you know, my interest in clinical science and, and I, I mentioned a reading a while back a, a study on Paxil. Let's imagine we were looking at um, a, a simple study, maybe an applied science type study, where we're trying to see if Paxil, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, is a, an efficacious treatment for depression. We might, in a very simple design, take participants and assign them to either get the treatment, like they get the Paxil, or get no treatment, you know, they get no Paxil, maybe they get a sugar pill as a placebo or something else. Um, then after a period of time, we observe people in both of those two groups and see if their levels of depression are different. That would be a pretty simple, um, a pretty simple uh, design, a uh, simple experimental design, as we'll see in a future lecture. Now, why am I highlighting this now? Well, just to kind of, you know, raise an interesting idea, raise an interesting question. Why, why is it that we bother with this no treatment group? Like, let's say you thought the Paxil was a, a good treatment for depression. Why wouldn't you just give it to all the people and see if they had decreased depression over time? You know, why do you bother assembling a group of people who don't get the treatment that you think is going to be effective for depression? Well, you do that because you want to create a counterfactual. A counterfactual just means like a comparison. It means what we think the treatment group would look like if they didn't get treatment. Um, now, why do we do that? We do that because we're really interested in studying causality. We're interested in studying claims about causality. Is it the case that treatment causes a change in depression? 
Now, a good counterfactual helps us rule out the effects of confounding variables. It helps us to establish a non-spurious relationship between our presumed cause or predictor or independent variable, in this case drug treatment, and our presumed effect or outcome variable or dependent variable, in this case level of depression. And the philosopher John Stuart Mill argued that establishing non-spuriousness of this relationship was important for determining whether causality had really occurred. And the philosopher David Hume had previously argued that temporal precedence and covariation were also really important for establishing causality. If we put this together, we see sort of the three, at least as we now think of them, the three kind of criteria for deciding or establishing a causal relationship. Does the cause precede the effect, temporal precedence? That's usually fairly easy to determine. We gave the drugs and then six months later we observed level of depression. Uh, covariation is uh, you know, a lot of what we do with our statistics. We try to determine the extent to which the variation in the cause, whether or not people got the drug, is associated with the variation in the effect, the level of depression that they subsequently reported. And this non-spuriousness is ruling out the possibility that some other variable could have affected people's level of depression. You know, maybe it's the case that six months down the line, uh, the people who got uh, the drug uh, Paxil showed less depression. Well, perhaps that's because of the effect of the drug. Perhaps that's also because over time, you know, the study was started in January and six months later it's the middle of the summer and so people are feeling happier because it's warmer outside. We need that counterfactual, that control group or that comparison group to observe what their change in mood is over that same period of time. Is it the case that they're getting a little bit happier? Um, well, maybe that's just reflecting change of time, change of season, some other spurious uh, or confounding variable. If their mood is improving, but not nearly so much so as the people in the active treatment group, the Paxil group, then we start to feel more confident that our prediction, our hypothesis, Paxil leads to you know improved, improved uh, mood, is truthful or is accurate, is our prediction has been borne out, which maybe supports or corroborates our general theory about Paxil and serotonin being involved in treating depression and so on. Now in an experimental design, researchers can create the counterfactual by creating different groups or conditions for different levels of the independent variable. And this is sometimes called experimental control because it involves controlling for or reducing the influence of confounding variables uh, by sampling or manipulating in such a way as to avoid them, or by counterbalancing or creating groups that are equivalent for them, etc. So you might imagine, like, let's presume that anxiety is related to depression. These things tend to be correlated with one another. And so if you want to control for the effect of anxiety on the apparent relationship between drug treatment and depression, you might randomly assign people to one of two groups with the expectation that, assuming you have a large enough sample, the average level of anxiety among people getting the drug will be the same as the average level of anxiety among people not getting the drug. Then, if you observe a difference in level of depression between those two groups, you have can't ascribe that difference to anxiety, at least not entirely. So you've kind of controlled for or removed that effect, potentially that spurious or confounding effect of anxiety from the study of the treatment of drug on uh, the effect of drug treatment on depression. That's in like a, a pretty basic experimental design. You know, in a simple non-experimental design, um, researchers often infer the counterfactual uh, by measuring potential sources of spurious or confounding effects. So rather than um, assigning people to get the drug or not, as you might in an experimental study, you might instead assign people to have either, or you might instead allow that some people will be taking the drug at a relatively low dose, other people will be taking the drug at a relatively high dose, and that perhaps their depression will vary uh, accordingly. So you might measure those two variables, the correlation between the two of them, and at the same time also measure the level of anxiety so as to be able to control for, statistically exclude the effect of anxiety on the relationship between drug dose and depression. Okay, so we've 
going back to our flowchart, we began uh, or we begun the research process with getting an idea. Somehow, we've framed it in a design. Maybe it's an experiment. Maybe it's a non-experiment. Now we're at the level of research methods. Here we're thinking about the variables we need to measure and trying to figure out exactly uh, how we're going to gather the data that we're going to need to test those hypotheses and thus evaluate that theory. I kind of used this quote before, but I'll use it again. It's from the, uh, the uh, psychologist E.L. Thorndike. He said, whatever exists at all exists in some amount. To know it thoroughly involves knowing its quantity as well as its quality. So he, we here in psychology, at least in the type of psychology research I do, are focused on quantitative methods. We're trying to come up with ways of assigning values, often numeric values, to different levels or, or stages of a particular phenomenon. And it's worth observing or, or noting that that's hard to do. You know, a lot of the stuff we study is abstract or non-concrete, things like anxiety and depression and alexithymia and neuroticism. These are things we can't easily point to in the real world and measure the way we might measure the, you know, the length of our desk or the weight of an apple or something like that. Nonetheless, we can, at least in principle, measure these things. And we need to measure these things so as to be able to test the predictions we're making, test our hypotheses, and thus evaluate our theory. And indeed, if you were taking a research methods class, you would spend your whole time, uh, the whole semester or more, thinking about different ways to measure different types of variables. Um, Again, this class is called experimental methods, but it's not really methods class because we're not going to talk in a very precise way, at least not much this semester, about the methods. We're going to just assume that you have methods to gather data on the variables that you're interested in. Now, once you've done all that, you're at the stage of data analysis or research data analysis. And this is really what we'll be doing mostly in this class. As I've already said a couple times, we'll be considering different ways to represent data pictographically, different ways to fit statistical models to that data, to compare and test differences between models and so on and so on. And at this point, I like to show this classic cartoon from The New Yorker. Hopefully you can see it in your resolution, but basically it's like two mathematicians standing at a chalkboard. There's a set of complex figures on the left, a set of complex figures and equations on the right, and in the middle there's this uh, note, then a miracle occurs. And one mathematician says to the other, I think you should be more explicit in step two. Um, well, that's what we're going to try and do in this. We're going to try and get to the nitty gritty of how some of the math works for research data analysis. And what we'll find, and this will take us really the rest of the semester pretty much, is that there are often different approaches to testing hypotheses. Usually there isn't just one correct way, and indeed most different ways we'll consider have strengths and weaknesses and depend on different assumptions we might make about the data we're using. So we'll spend time working on that. Even though this is called, weirdly, a methods class, it's really an analysis class for the most part. That said, we are going to talk in the next lecture a little bit more about design and methods because I want to spend some more time with these broad areas of the research process before moving fully beyond them. Okay, that's what we're going to learn, so buckle up, kids. Anyway, important ideas so far. The research process involves different steps. And again, for me personally, really coming to understand those steps and appreciate them has made learning about them, learning research design, learning research methods, and in our case here, learning research analysis, statistics, a lot easier. Seeing connections for me uh, was helpful in my learning process. Hopefully it will be helpful in your learning process too. With that in mind, in our next class, we'll be spending, as I said, a bit more time on research design and a little more time on research methods, even though this isn't technically a methods class despite its name, so as to fully lay a foundation for all the cool and interesting data analysis stuff that we'll be doing in the rest of the semester. So as I always say, um, thanks for your attention. I really appreciate all the time people took or take in watching my videos. I know this is, there's more interesting stuff to watch on YouTube than, than me. So if you've watched this video, thanks very much. I hope you learned something and I hope you're inspired and maybe even interested and, and ready to learn more. And when you're ready, I'll be back with another video for you to watch. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.